Hi class and welcome to part two of chapter nine on muscles. We started this um, on Thursday in our live class se session and I told you I would kind of finish it out in a recorded session. We just have a couple more slides to get through. Um, and again, like usual, I'll try to point out important things you should know. Um, for example, in this chapter, you should know very well the steps leading up to muscle contraction, the neuromuscular junction, and then the, all the following slides as well. Um, so understanding very well the processes behind that, the order of those processes, and, and all the things involved in that. So what is excitation contraction coupling? We're kind of in our next step in the big picture of how your muscles contract. And these are all the events that transmit an action potential along the sarcolemma, which is the um, plasma membrane of the muscle cell in order to excite the muscle cell so that we can eventually slide the myofilaments, the actin and myosin um, along each other for that contraction to occur. So our action potential is propagated along the sarcolemma. And again, the sarcolemma is the plasma membrane of the muscle cell. And then it goes down into the T tubules where voltage gated or voltage sensitive proteins, excuse me, in the tubules stimulate the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And again, I've emphasized this a lot. You should know that calcium is released and stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And this calcium release is what will lead to the muscle contraction. The action potential will be very brief and it will end before the contraction is actually seen. So here is excitation contraction coupling. It's a sequence of events by which the transmission of an action potential along the sarcolemma of a muscle fiber leads to the sliding of the myofilaments. So here's the first step. We have the action potential being propagated along the sarcolemma and eventually down into the T tubule. So that's the first step. The second step then is calcium ions are being released and these are the calcium channels. And then you can see the calcium being released from the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Here's the terminal cisternae of the sarcoplasmic reticulum and then you see the calcium being released. Calcium will then bind to troponin. And troponin, this is kind of hard to see, but the troponin is the yellow protein on the actin. What that will do, it will remove the blocking action of tropomyosin. Tropomyosin were these long spaghetti-like strands that are blocking the myosin binding sites on the actin. So calcium binds to troponin and that removes the blocking action of the tropomyosin. When that happens, the myosin heads, which are shown here, can then reach up and bind to the actin because the sites are free. And when the myosin heads bind to the actin, that forms a cross bridge. And then the myosin will slide the actin by it. At very low intracellular calcium levels, our calcium concentration, tropomyosin will always block the active sites on actin. Myosis, myosin heads cannot attach and the muscle fiber will remain relaxed. The voltage sensitive proteins and T tubules will change shape, causing the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium to the cytosol. When we get a higher intracellular calcium concentration, calcium will bind to the troponin. Troponin changes shape, moves tropomyosin away from the myosin binding sites, and this allows the myosin heads to bind to actin, forming the cross bridge. And then we get into our cycling, causing the sarcomere to shorten and muscle to contract. When the nervous stimulation ceases, so when that muscle stops being stimulated, calcium will be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum and contraction will end. So here are the four steps in cross bridge cycling and cross bridge cycling refers to the idea of forming a cross bridge between actin and myosin and then sliding them past each other. So the high energy myosin head will first attach to the actin thin filament active site. And then we have what we call a working or power stroke where the myosin head will pivot and pull the thin filament toward the M line. So we're just trying to slide the actin past the myosin. Then the cross bridge will detach and that requires ATP. Um, ATP will attach to the myosin head, causing the cross bridge to detach. And then the myosin head will kind of cock back into place. Energy from hydrolysis of ATP will get the myosin head kind of ready back into the high energy state for the next cross bridge cycle to occur. So here are all the steps the cross bridge forms between the actin and myosin. 
the myosin head kind of does this power stroke, power stroke that pulls the actin towards the middle of the sarcomere. The cross bridge detaches with the presence of ATP and then the cocking of the myosin head back into a high energy state gets ready for kind of the next cross bridge cycle to occur. Rigor mortis, I briefly mentioned this last time, about three to four hours after death, the muscles begin to stiffen. Um, the peak rigidity or stiffening occurs about 12 hours um, after death. And this occurs because um, ATP is no longer being made by the cells. So no calcium ions can be pumped back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This results in a constant cross bridge formation and ATP is also needed for the detachment of myosin from actin. So this also keeps your muscles in a constant state of contraction. Um, the muscles will stay contracted until muscle proteins will eventually break down, causing the myosin to release. So now we'll talk a little bit about tension. The same principles apply to contraction of both single fibers and whole fibers and contraction produces muscle tension where the force exerted on the load or object to be moved is called muscle tension. And a contraction may or may not shorten a muscle. And you should know the, these two differences between isometric contraction and isotonic contraction. There will be a test question about these two. So isometric contraction, this means the muscle does not shorten, but the muscle tension increases. So it does not exceed the load. What this means, and an example of an isometric contraction would be, for example, you pushing up against an immovable wall. So you're putting a lot of tension on your muscles. They are becoming tense because you're pushing up against a wall. So your muscles are getting tense, but they're not actually shortening um, because you're not actually pushing that wall over. Your muscles aren't actually moving, but they are getting tense. Um, an isotonic contraction is when the muscle does shorten because the muscle tension exceeds the load. And an isotonic contraction would be the simple act of lifting up, um, lifting up your cup of coffee. Your muscle is becoming tense and it's also shortening because it's producing some movement. The force and duration of contraction varies in response to stimuli of different frequencies and intensities. Each muscle is served by at least one motor nerve and motor nerves contain axons of up to hundreds of motor neurons. Axons will branch into their terminals, each of which will form the neuromuscular junction with a single muscle fiber that you guys are familiar with. And a motor unit is the nerve muscle functional unit. You should know this definition of a motor unit. Um, a motor unit consists of the motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it supplies. So it can be four muscle fibers or it can be several hundred muscle fibers. The smaller the fiber number, the greater the control. So um, in your fingers, for example, they have very fine control. You have, so you have a smaller number of motor units. Muscle fibers from a motor unit are spread throughout the whole muscle. So stimulation of a single motor unit causes only weak contraction of the entire muscle. So here's a look at a motor unit. Again, here's a great definition in the title slide that you should know. So a motor unit consists of one motor neuron and all of the muscle fibers that it innervates. So here's one motor unit because it's consisting of one motor neuron. And this motor um, unit has two muscle fibers that it innervates. And this motor unit in three, in red, has three muscle fibers that it innervates because it branches into three. A muscle twitch is the simplest contraction resulting from a muscle fiber's response to a single action potential from a motor neuron. And you will need to know about muscle twitches a little bit. The muscle fiber will contract quickly and then relax. And the twitch, twitch can actually be observed and recorded as a myogram. And you will look at different tracings, which are lines recording contraction activity um, in next week's lab when we do the Physio X lab. So here are the three phases of a muscle twitch, the latent period, the period of contraction, and then the period of relaxation. The latent period are the events of the ex excitation contraction coupling where no muscle tension is seen yet. The period of contraction is specifically when the cross bridge forms. So that's when we get our tension. And then relaxation means that calcium has re-entered the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Um, muscles will always contract faster than they will relax. So here are the three phases of the muscle twitch, the latent period, the period of contraction, and the period of relaxation, and you should know those three phases.
Differences in strength and duration of twitches are due to variations in different metabolic properties and enzymes between muscles. So for example, your eye muscles contract rapid and brief, uh, whereas larger fleshy muscles like your calf, your quadriceps contract more slowly and hold that contraction longer. So here's the muscle twitch differences between the lateral rectus, which is one of the eye muscles attached to the lateral side of the eye, the gastrocnemius and the soleus. You can see how the muscle twitch can be lengthened or held um, constant a little more depending on the type of muscle. Muscle responses, um, I don't know if I ask, ask you too many questions about muscle responses specifically. Um, a graded muscle response will vary in strength of contraction for different demands. And this is required just for proper control of your skeletal movement. And responses are graded by the changing frequency of the stimulation and the strength of the stimulation. Muscle response to changes in stimulus frequency, a single stimulus results in one single contractile response, and that's a muscle twitch. So here's a contraction, a stimulus, and then a contraction, relaxation, a stimulus, contraction. Um, these are individual twitches. A second stimulus will be delivered after relaxation is complete. So we don't have a summation, meaning we don't aren't adding these um, contractions on top of each other. Muscle response to changes in stimulus frequency, we can have a wave summation results of two stimuli are received by a muscle in rapid succession. So your muscle fibers do not have time to completely relax between stimuli. So your twitches will increase in force each stimulus. Additional calcium that is released with the second stimulus um, stimulates more shortening. So these are this is temporal summation where we're starting to summate our contractions together because we're not getting a complete relaxation. We're only getting partial relaxation. So anytime we stimulate that muscle, we're getting a higher temperature or a higher tension, excuse me, as the muscle tension or contractions are um, summating or adding together to form a larger contraction. If the stimuli frequency increases, the muscle tension reaches near maximum, and this can produce a smooth, continuous contraction that adds up, that's called summation. Further increase in stimulus frequency causes the muscle to progress to sustained quivering contraction referred to as unf unfused or incomplete tetanus. So here's unfused or incomplete tetanus where we have a high stimulation frequency. We're stimulating this muscle without it being able to relax. And this is called unfused tetanus. If the stimuli frequency even further increases, the muscle tension can re reach maximum. And we call this fused tetanus because all the contractions will fuse together into one smooth, sustained muscle contraction. And this prolonged muscle contraction can lead to muscle fatigue. So we don't really want our muscles to get into this fused tetanus state where they're just constantly contracting. These last, so we always have, this is six out of seven slides. There might be one question from these seven slides, um, but not much. Recruitment or multiple motor unit summation is when a stimulus is sent to more muscle fibers leading to more precise control. And types of stimulus involved in recruitment is a sub-threshold stimulus where the stimulus is not strong enough, so no contractions are seen. The threshold stimulus, the stimulus is strong enough to cause a first observable contraction. And then a maximal stimulus is the strongest stimulus that increases maximum contractile force and will recruit all motor units to a specific muscle just to kind of get um, that muscle working as much as we can. So here's the proportion of motor units excited. And you can see as we stimulate more and more, we're recruiting more and more motor units to try to um, contract the entire muscle. So that's recruitment. Graded muscle responses, muscle response to changes in stimulus strength. Recruitment works on a size principle, meaning that motor units with smallest muscle fibers will be recruited first. And then motor units with larger fibers are recruited as the stimulus intensity increases. Largest motor units are only activated for the most powerful contractions. And motor units in muscles usually contract asynchronously, so not always at the same time. And this is to help prevent fatigue so that all of the muscle fibers are not becoming fatigued or tiring out. So some fibers might contract while, these, while the others rest and vice versa.
So here is a look at a small fiber motor unit recruited, medium and large with the tension of the muscle increasing over time. Muscle tone then, you should know this definition, is a constant slightly contracted state of all muscles it's due to spinal reflexes where we have groups of motor units are alternatively activated in response to the input from stretch receptors in muscles. This keeps all your muscles firm, healthy, and ready to respond. As a part of our isotonic contraction, which we um, talked about, this is where your muscle changes in length and moves a load. So for example, lifting up a weight or your cup of coffee. Isotonic contractions, we can call them concentric or eccentric. Concentric means the muscle shortens and does work. For example, your biceps picking up a book. An eccentric contraction is when the muscle lengthens and generates force. So for example, laying the book down, causing the biceps to lengthen while generating the force. So here's a look at isotonic contractions. Um, we can see the difference here. Muscle develops enough tension or force to lift the weight, um, as you can see on the right. Um, after the resistance has been overcome. So that's a concentric contraction because it's doing work, it's moving. This is showing concentric and isometric contractions. Um, here we have the peak tension is developing, the muscles relaxing, and the muscle length of resting length um, is decreasing here. So isometric contractions, remember, is when the load is greater than the maximum tension the muscle can generate. So neither the muscle shortens nor lengthens. And again, an isometric contraction is you pushing up against a wall, you trying to lift a 100 pound weight. Let's say you can't do that. I don't know if I could. So your muscles are tensing, but they're not doing any work because they're not actually moving. Electrical, chemical, and mechanical events are the same in both these types of contraction, but the results are a little different. In an isotonic contraction, remember that's the one where the muscle moves and does work, the actin filaments will shorten, but in an isometric contraction, the cross bridges will generate force, but the actin filaments do not shorten. So the myosin heads are like spinning their wheels on the same actin binding site. So again, here's an isometric contraction, the muscles contracting, there's tension, but it's not actually moving or decreasing in length because it's not strong enough to lift that weight. All right, uh, providing energy for contraction. So ATP is what supplies the energy needed for the muscle fiber to move and detach from the cross bridges, pump calcium back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and then do our sodium potassium pump after the excitation contraction coupling. The available stores of ATP are depleted in your muscles every four to six seconds. ATP is the only source of energy for contractile activities, and therefore we must be creating ATP often in our muscle cells. ATP is made by these three mechanisms, direct phosphorylation of ADP. That means just adding another phosphate group to ADP to create ATP. The anaerobic pathway uses glycolysis and lactic acid formation because it's doing it without oxygen. And the aerobic pathway is the most efficient way to create ATP because it uses oxygen. So here's direct phosphor phosphorylation. Um, all you really need to know here is that we're taking a phosphate group from creatine phosphate, adding it to adenosine diphosphate with two. And when we add one phosphate to two phosphates, we get an ATP out of the end. So here's direct phosphorylation. The anaerobic pathway, ATP, can also be generated by breaking down and using energy stored in glucose. So we go through glycolysis, which kind of breaks down glucose. It doesn't require oxygen. Um, it breaks down glucose into two pyruvic acid model, molecules, and we get two ATPs out of the deal. The low oxygen levels prevent pyruvic acid from entering the aerobic respiration phase, which will, would go on to form even more ATP. So it kind of just stops here in the anaerobic pathway. Normally, pyruvic acid will enter mitochondria to start aerobic respiration phase if oxygen is present. But however, at high intensity levels of activity and exercise, when your muscle cells run out of oxygen, oxygen is not available. So bulgy muscles will compress blood vessels. They'll impair oxygen delivery. And in the absence of oxygen, and again, this is referred to as anaerobic glycolysis. Pyruvic acid is converted to lactic acid. And you should know this. 
in anaerobic respiration or this anaerobic pathway when oxygen is not present, this pyruvic acid will get converted to lactic acid and the lactic acid um, will actually build up in your, in your muscles. And that's what you can feel as causing the burn after you kind of um, work out a lot is that lactic acid buildup because after a while your muscles run out of oxygen. So your pyruvic acid gets converted to lactic acid instead of going on to create more ATP that it would in normal oxygen present conditions. So the anaerobic pathway, lactic acid then diffuses into the bloodstream. Um, it's used by your, as fuel by your liver, kidneys, and heart. It will be eventually converted back into pyruvic acid or glucose. And anaerobic respiration only yields 5% as much ATP as aerobic respiration. That just means that without oxygen, your cells can't um, create as much um, ATP as needed. So here's the anaerobic pathway that leads to lactic acid in the absence of oxygen. Aerobic respiration in the presence of oxygen is what produces the most of the ATP. Um, it's slower than the anaerobic pathway. What it does is it consists of a series of chemical reactions that we will learn about that occur in the mitochondria and require oxygen. Um, we cr can create up to 32 ATP from one glucose molecule. We can also use other fuels like fatty acids to create ATP um, after about 30 minutes of exercise. Energy systems during sports, we have aerobic endurance and an the anaerobic threshold, the point at which muscle metabolism will convert to the anaerobic pathway. So here we have high intensity exercise, usually using aerobic respiration and then prolonged duration exercise. Eventually um, we will do other pathways to get to it. Muscle fatigue, you should know a little bit. Fatigue is the physiological inability to contract despite continuous stimulation and possible causes may be ionic imbalances that can cause fatigue or increased inorganic phosphate from creatine phosphate and ATP breakdown, which could interfere with calcium release from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you should know a little bit about muscle fatigue also due to decreased ATP or increased magnesium, decreased glycogen, the lack of ATP is rarely a reason for fatigue, except in severely stressed muscles. So for a muscle to return to its pre-exercise state, we need to re replenish our oxygen, convert our lactic acid back to pyruvic acid, replace our glycogen stores, and we need to resynthesize our ATP in creatine phosphate reserves. All of these replenishing steps require extra oxygen. So this is referred to as excess post-exercise oxygen consumption, um, formally referred to as our oxygen debt. So the force of muscle contractions, and we're almost done here, the force of contraction depends on the number of cross bridges attached, which is affected by these four fibers. The number of muscle fibers stimulated, which is recruitment, the relative size of the fibers, the bulkier the muscle, the more tension it can develop. Muscles can increase in size, as we know, that's called hypertrophy with regular exercise. The frequency of stimulation, the higher your frequency, the greater the force because they can be added together. And the degree, the degree of muscle stretch, muscle fibers with sarcomeres that are 80, 100 to 120% their normal resting length will generate more force. So these are some factors that can increase the force of skeletal muscle contraction. Here's the length tension relationship of the sarcomeres and skeletal muscles, whether they're greatly shortened at resting or excessively stretched, and then the tension of on put on those muscles. How fast a muscle contracts and how long it can stay contracted is influenced by the muscle fiber type, load and recruitment. And we have slow and fast fibers in our muscle cells. And this refers to the speed of contraction, the speed at which myosin ATPases split the ATP and the pattern of activity of the motor neurons. The metabolic pathway is used for ATP synthesis, the oxidative fibers and the lycolytic fibers. So slow oxidative, so based on these two criteria, skeletal muscle fibers can be classified into three types, slow oxidative, fast, fast oxidative or fast glycolytic, and most muscles contain a mixture of these three types of fibers resulting in a range of contractile speed and fatigue resistance. All fibers in one motor unit are the same and genetics can dictate the individual's percentage of each.
Um, different muscle types are better suited for different jobs. So slow oxidative fibers are for low intensity endurance activities. So we'll find a lot of these fibers in your back muscles to maintain posture. Fast oxidative fibers are for medium intensity activities like sprinting or walking. And then fast glycolytic fibers are more for short-term intense or powerful movements like hitting a baseball. So here we have kind of these three factors influencing the velocity and duration of skeletal muscle. And this takes you through the characteristics of the three types of fibers and the differences between them. There might be one question on knowing the differences between these three types of fibers. Load and recruitment. Load is when muscles contract faster when no load is added. So the greater the load, the shorter the duration of the contraction, or the greater the load, the slower the contraction. And recruitment refers to the more motor units contracting, the faster and more prolonged the contraction. Aerobic endurance exercise is jogging, swimming, biking. That can lead to increased capillaries, mitochondria, myoglobin synthesis, all good things. It may actually convert your fast glycolytic fibers into fast oxidative fibers. So it could result in greater endurance, strength, and resistance to fatigue. Resistance exercise, such as weightlifting, leads to muscle hypertrophy, getting larger, increased mitochondria, and also increased muscle strength and size. Muscles uh, must be active, however, to remain in healthy. We can get disuse atrophy with the degeneration and loss of mass due to the disuse of muscles and loss of neural stimulation. Um, so paralyzed muscles often atrophy. Smooth muscle fibers. Um, so here's some differences between smooth and skeletal muscle fibers. And I don't think I ask you guys any questions about this, but I'm gonna include them in here because it talks a little bit about how smooth muscle fibers contract and you can see those here. So I would encourage you to read through that. In these last couple slides, um, there might be one question from here, um, but you, I don't offer you too many questions knowing the difference between smooth skeletal and cardiac other than this chart and knowing these differences there. This is also a good chart to study. These are kind of ending um, slides to just help you review the information here. Um, and I will end this PowerPoint. Thanks for listening to part two, guys, and take care.